All right. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> Welcome to lecture four. Um, so, so far already we've covered our enemies, we've got our player movement down, and we've got some basics to Unity, and now we're going to go over some game mechanics and our objective. Um, oh, i got to click. So a couple announcements. Our Unreal Workshop has been moved to Monday, 3, 2. So it was, gonna, it was initially planned for next week, but um, we're just going to move it back just for, for now. And also, um, af officer applications are going to be opening up. So if you guys are interested in applying, um, we will have a link posted soon. So just keep in tune with our Facebook, and it should come up. So we talked a lot about like, um, like a project, um, top-down shooter, you guys might have heard already. So um, here's like the actual specifications. It's more of like an optional project. Um, and our plan is on the last lecture, we're going to have like a showcase. So whoever was able to finish the project um, can like showcase what they did and um, like show off like at the front how it goes. Um, by this point, especially after this lecture, you should already have like enough material to be able to like get a pretty good working project going. Um, like we've covered enemies already and this is going to be your like objective. So what like how you would actually like win the games or like your core gameplay mechanics will be covered today. And I mean, after this class, it's just going to be a lot of polish and UI. And so, yeah, I would definitely consider looking into making something here. We don't have any like cool example projects, but hopefully after this quarter, we might get some talking to you podcast people. Nice. And of course, um, since this, I like, gave like, a pretty vague spec, which is just like top-down. Um, before, it was like top-down shooter, but we didn't want to limit it to just like ranged. So if you want to go like melee, um, as long as it's top-down, that would be cool. And that should give you enough like, creative freedom to make what you got to make. So getting right into it, we're going to talk about our game managers. So if you remember our enemy spawners, um, you sort of already started working with the concept of a game manager itself. Um, some key ideas from that is that it's an invisible like, game object that controls um, how enemies are spawning. Um, there's also many different types of spawners. There's a lot of like, variety of what you can do with it. And it also has references to many objects on the scene um, in the point of a spawner it references like spawn points. And of course, um, there's also like one enemy spawner usually for the entire level. And um, we can have also have multiple spawners, but that would be controlled by like one main spawner, which is known as a manager. But what exactly is a manager? So a manager, there are two like main points for managers. Um, it's an entity that controls and it handles a group. Um, in our case, it's going to be that group that it's controlling is the objects in our scene and the scene itself. Uh, we'll go into more detail what controlling and handling is, but for now you can just think of your game managers um, or like uh, your enemy spawners as a big example of that. Um, for example, for these spawners, they control um, what enemies are created and they also like they also handle if the count of enemies like goes through a certain point, it could do like a different function, spawn the next wave, things like that. Cool. So what about the, the game manage objects itself? We're gonna take that enemy spawner script and essentially like blow it up into more of just like scene management in general. Um, just like your enemy spawner, it's again it's gonna be an invisible game object that just exists in the scene. Um, you're not gonna, it's not going to have like, any images connected to it. You just, like, it's just there and it controls everything. Um, it's usually built with like, a collection of scripts. You're going to have multiple managers, such as like, the enemy spawner manager and um, like a timer manager or point system. Um, it's going to be built up with multiple things. It's not usually just one giant script, just because that's really hard to like, run through. And 
And why do we not just like place this on our player or like any other um, script or like any other object? Um, it just makes it really hard to find. If it's like on a player, you always have to like find the player and like and then go find the script because the player itself is going to have a bunch of like movement scripts and attack scripts, and it just makes it really hard to find what manager you're looking for. And also, the idea is like, what if that object gets destroyed? Um, it doesn't have to be the player. You, if you put your game manager on like any other object, that object could like get destroyed in some way, just because of like just how the core gameplay works, and that could be a problem because. You want your manager to be working all the time, and you don't want it to just disappear. And here's an example of like a good way to um, to like organize your game manager. Um, in this situation, I just had one game manager like parent object and a bunch of its like sub managers like enemy spawn, resource, reset. Um, this is just one way to do it. Another way to do it is just have like one game manager object and just have all your scripts on that one object too. This one could get cluttered, like if you have a lot of scripts, um, you'll have to like scroll down and things like that, but it also just makes it a little bit more convenient, especially if um, you don't have too many scripts, you just want to just like look. So it's more of a preference, really. And there's an idea here with managers, is there's only really one root manager. So let's say like for spawner scripts, you have multiple different types of spawns. That's okay to have multiple spawner scripts. But you want to have one game manager or one uh, spawner manager that controls all of those, and they have references to them. And the main benefit of having one spawner is that you can easily reference it um, in your scripts. You can just use this command find object of type and then the manager type, and it's going to easily find that script. If you have multiple objects of that one script, it's just going to you don't really know which one it's going to return, but if we keep this property of having just one root manager, then you'll know that you're going to get the right manager calling this function. And capabilities of the game manager. These, this is something that we talked about a little bit earlier, about controlling and handling um, parts of the scene. So um, I split this up into two categories, uh, but a lot of them really go hand in hand. So one capability is controlling objects. And this is essentially changing the objects in your scene. It could be with like spawning enemies, moving the player, changing it around, or like resetting it in general. And game managers also handle or respond to events. This could be like when a player reaches a certain endpoint, um, the game manager would end the game essentially, or when a certain number of enemies are like destroyed by the player, then that could trigger events in the game manager itself. So when you're writing your game manager script, um, talk, thinking about these control and handle um, methods, we want to split up into private and public. So your control methods, you usually want to keep private just because it keeps the idea that the manager is the one that has the final say into what gets like, changed. And your handlers are going to be public because since handlers are taking input from outside of the manager, like such as the player or like enemies, it needs a way to communicate to the manager itself, so these should be public. But of course, handler methods can use these control methods. So I know it, could, it might seem a little redundant if you're just calling a handler that just immediately calls a, con like a control method. Um, but essentially, it keeps the idea that you have to go through the manager first to change anything. So the manager still has the final say. And this is also important because you might want to do multiple control methods um, per like event. Um, I'll sh I think I should have an example of that right here. So um, these are examples of like control methods that are just focusing on one set of objects. Um, and specifically, these are like pausing. Um, as you can see, it finds the player, it pauses it. Uh, essentially, the method's not really shown, but uh, stops the player from moving. Same with the enemies, it finds every enemy and it also stops the spawner from spawning everything. Also, um, a lot of today's scripts are going to be very like skeleton cody, so it's going to um, I'm going to like reference a lot of like methods from outside scripts, but it's more like of pseudocode essentially. It's not going to show like the specific implementations, but the main idea is that it's pausing enemies, stopping them from functioning, 
and same with like spawners and players. Um, and here's an example of a handler which pause game. So that's when like the player actually like hits the pause button or any other method that would stop the game. As you can see, it, it handles internal variables such as when uh, the game is paused and it also calls the other controls. So this sort of like counteracts that redundancy that I talked about earlier, where it's actually like doing more, more than one thing. Um, in this case, like three controls and then changes the internal of the, of the game manager itself. And um, another good thing about game managers is that they're still mono behaviors, so you're still gonna have access to your basic functions like update, fixed update, start, and awake. So these are still useful. You can still like initialize your variables. You can keep your timers going, and that allows you to like do a lot with your managers. Cool. And any questions on managers itself? Nice. So now let's go into specific objectives. So we talked a lot about like the basics of creating your game manager. Now we're actually going to apply them to specific objectives of the game. And uh, the thing with, is with, obje with objectives is that it could be very unique to your game. Um, a lot of like game developers try to like make something super unique and new, and that's that's like their driving force to um, like to create a new fresh game is like an objective that hasn't been seen before. Um, there's also a lot of games that build off of like classic objectives too, or just like mix and match. And for this lecture, we're just gonna go over some of like examples of like these classic objectives, like a time limit, point system, things like that, just to like give you guys an idea of how like the power, what, what you can do with your game managers essentially. Um, yeah, so we're just gonna get right into a time limit. Um, so the idea of a time limit is essentially it's like a scene timer for your level that ticks down um, and essentially runs out. And if the player doesn't either like complete the level or it, it could be like an endless game where the player could just like keep racking up points. Um, but once the timer finishes, the level ends and usually a score is given to the player or just restarts in general. Um, essentially, um, some possible features you want to include if you're thinking of adding a game timer is the ability to like resume and pause the timer is this especially important when like the player pauses the game. Um, a way to add time might be nice. Uh, this could be like in the form of a like pickup where the player picks up a time object or gets a certain amount of kills. It could add time and increase the player's play time. And uh, another cool feature could be like the ability to slow time or just time manipulation in general. In the example I will show you later, um, it will. I sort of made like a bullet time script where when you press a button, essentially um, the projectile speed gets cut in half and also the timer ticks um, a little bit slower too. So here's just some like example code for a timer itself. The main key thing I'm doing here is the update method. Of course, I'm just ticking down the timer and start, I'm setting it to that um, start game time that the player would set outside in the inspector. And then it would just keep ticking down from there. And then after that ticks down, that's when you want to um, control what happens, which in this case, it just restarts the scene. Probably in your game, you don't want something so abrupt. This is literally just gonna just restart the scene like instantly, and that could be jarring to the player. But so in your implementations, um, I recommend doing like a sequence where it either like shows like a menu to the player that the game has ended and they can restart manually. But the key idea here is timer ticks down and then an event happens, which in this case just restarts. And two handler methods I put up there, as I talked about earlier, is your pause game and your resume game. This was shown um, earlier. Um, this is just a showing in relation to the timer itself, what that variable is paused is actually doing essentially just stopping the timer from ticking down if the game is paused. And here's um, an example of like having objective of adding time. Um, so I have like a private um, helper method which just adds time. So you can use that to subtract or add. And I have public methods here that outside references call. These are your handlers. They 
um, do the specific like additions or subtractions. So let's say you can have like a pickup that gives you five seconds or like a really rare pickup that gives you 25 seconds. Um, like a different variety like that or also just like negative things such as time penalties are also possible. And sort of combining, um, let's see, oh, this is the bullet time one, right. That's a, yes. So essentially in this bullet time, I have two private methods. Um, these are your control methods. Essentially one of them is to slow down. Um, essentially when slow down is called, it, um, it reduces the time multiplier, which I believe I show, Oh, I don't show it here, but essentially your time multiplier would be multiplied by time dot delta time, and you would use like a fraction. So if your time multiplier is like 0.5, it will tick down at half its rate. And yeah, so when slowdown is called, the time ticks down at half its rate, and you're changing the speed of your enemies and their projectiles to half a speed also to match that time difference. And then you'll also have more normal speed to go back to normal. And here's like a cool GIF example of that. The enemy shoot and then um, I mapped you to change um, the time and it would slow down the projectiles for you to dodge them. Cool. And another common um, example is a point and score system. This is really common in just like a lot of games in general. I'm, I'm sure you guys have run into many of these. And essentially just like points are gonna be awarded to players for like specific, doing specific actions. You're, you're giving them a reward for um, essentially playing the game, um, playing the objectives. This could be done uh, explicitly, like when the player like does a certain action such as like get a certain kill or finish a wave, or um, it could be also done passively, which is a lot, really possible in like survival based games where your objective is just to stay alive for as long as you can. But again, the key idea is you're rewarding the player for doing the objective, which in these survival games is just staying alive. And that's why you're giving them passive points for that. Um, yeah, so these are just like a measure of how well the score or how well the player is doing. And it's a good way for them to know and compare themselves to other scores to see if they did well based on those scores like such as others or their own scores. But for implementations, I'm gonna show you three features, which is incrementing, uh, multiplier, and passive point gain, which I talked about for survival games. So increment and decrement, pretty straightforward. It's just, you're just able to call these uh, methods to add points or reduce points, and then you can also just check how many points you have pretty straightforward there. And then the multiplier is when it gets a little bit more interesting, where you can call methods to either double how, much, how many points you get, or also just reset it back to one. And essentially now when you're adding points, it's keeping that multiplier in check. So if your multiplier is two, of course it's gonna double how many points you get. And I mean, for these, I'm just updating a variable, which is gonna be saved. And that's what you wanna reference when you're checking how many points you get. Um, and usually points are going to be shown in your UI system, which we will be covering in the next few weeks. And here's where it gets really cool is your passive point gain um, with the multiplier also. So um, again, you have your same multiplier that can either double or just go back to normal. And I made a new method called increment points. And if you look at update, I'm using my like basic timer. Um, timer-like method, I'm calling increment points after the tick time is there. So it's gonna keep giving you points after a certain tick time, which at this is just one second. And it also keeps track of your multiplier. So if you double your multiplier, you're gonna get double the points um, every tick. And another cool objective, or not really objective, but just like core, cool game mechanic that you can do, especially for like progression-based games is checkpoints. And the main purpose of these is to essentially um, give a player like a local save of where to go back if they, um, if they die or um, fail like an objective or something. Um, I, I wanna highlight local pr progression here. 
Uh, essentially, this is not, it's called local because it doesn't really save anything in the game like entirely. It just saves it for that play session or that level itself. Um, in a couple lectures from now, we'll go over save states, and those are going to be your global progression, where you can actually save data, so when the player like, closes the game or leaves for a while, they can just come back and load a save. But this one's just local progression, just for the play session itself. So the features that I'm going to be showing here is just setting your respawn point, and also respawning the player using a reset manager. Um, so how would you want to make like a checkpoint object itself? In this case, we're going to be going back to our colliders. We're going to be setting this collider to a trigger, which is a lot, it's going to be different from be not a trigger, right? Because when an object or a collider is a trigger, um, other objects will actually pass through it. Even, especially if it's um, set in your like physics matrix, if it's set to collide, it's still just going to pass through. But what you can do with triggers um, is that there's, a, there's an event called on trigger enter 2D, or a callback rather. And when an when a object that, um, is, that's supposed to collide with that collider, like based on your matrix that you set, it passes through your um, trigger, it's going to call that. And that's what you can use to like, do like, behind the scenes work, or like any sensors. Um, these triggers are really useful for that. And in this case, when the player enters this trigger, it's just gonna call, um, it's gonna call the set checkpoint and it's gonna remember that point. And where it's gonna call that is the reset manager. So the reset manager, its main goal is remembering the last checkpoint that the player used. And it also, so like when checkpoints handle when, a pl when like the player walks into it, it's going to contact the reset manager, and the reset is going to handle that information and save where that checkpoint is. Um, it's also going to handle when the player dies, which is why it's called the reset manager. When like, the player dies, it's going to be in charge of putting everything back to um, its state, where, whereas like, the player like, never left that checkpoint. It's going to try to remember as much as it can. And you can remember as much as um, you want with the reset manager or as little as you want, but the main goal is to try to come back to that state from when that player first hit that checkpoint. And here's an example of a checkpoint script and your reset manager, just a simple reset manager. Um, again, you're just using that on trigger enter method, and when it's a player, it's going to remember that checkpoint. As you can see, I'm using that find object by type method to easily find that reset manager. And it's going to set the checkpoint. And essentially, we're going to go over respawning players when the player dies. It would be calling that respawn player. Um, yeah, so when the re essentially, when the player respawns, we're just resetting health. And the player is teleported back to where that checkpoint is. And again, I was saying that this is a very simple Im implementation of a reset manager. And since you want to go back to that original state, you're most likely going to want to do a lot more than this. For example, like if you have like a wave-based system, you want to reset the wave, you want to delete all the enemies. And these could get, this could get pretty like hectic in many games. Like for example, in Uno 108, um, I also had to worry about respawning enemies and put them back in their starting positions back when, um, when the player would die, which that's like another form of bookkeeping that you have to do. You have to remember which enemies you should respawn because you don't really want to respawn all of them, right? If the enemies you killed before the checkpoint are dead, you don't want to respawn those because you already hit the checkpoint. Um, so there's definitely going to be a lot more work that you can put into a reset manager. And another cool gameplay mechanic that you can implement are power-ups. So essentially, power-up is just going to be a temporary buff to the player. Um, gonna enhance like the player's gameplay experience and you want to think about like how the player could get these power-ups um, a lot of games just have like pickups such as um, like Mario Kart for example you just like go over a cube and then you get like a cool power-up and it could be based on like stats such as like a point multiplier like if you have um, a lot of like if your multiplier is high you could get like a damage boost 
I know Crypt of the Necrodancer has weapons that um, increase damage based on your multiplier. Or it could just be like just random, where at certain times you just give a player a random buff or a debuff. Um, that could be a cool idea. So example power-ups that we're going to be going over are speed, healing, and rapid fire. Not multi-shot, just rapid fire. Um, so pick up objects. If you're going to, for our examples here, um, I can talk about these like objects that you would walk over essentially and pick up for the power up. This again relies on that trigger collider because you don't really want to collide with these objects. You sort of just want to pass through them and then essentially pick them up. Um, so on the trigger enter, you want to call the correct like power up method in your power up manager and you want to destroy it because you want the player to just keep running into it and just get infinite power ups. So speed boosting, um, that's a common power up. Uh, a lot of like racing games would have that. Um, like in Rocket League, you would go over the speed like pickups, and then it would give you like a boost for your fuel. Um, I just did like a very simple Im implementation of that, where um, essentially, your once you go over your uh, speed pickup object, it's going to call this pickup speed method, and it's going to set your current buff to one. So the way I'm implementing this power up uh, manager is I'm sort of using like a pseudo state system where current buff holds, uh, remembers like what the player currently has as its buff. Um, I'm just using integers because there's multiple buffs here. Like, so for example, this one is speed. So one is for speed. It's going to set that. And it's also going to set your duration, which um, this manager will keep track of that. Um, each buff will have different durations, like as you can see at the top, the speed is 5 seconds. It's going to remember that and set the duration, and an update, if the duration is up, it's just going to tick that down. And then once the timer ends, it's going to put the speed back to normal. And yeah, so I mean, player movement is being referenced, I'm just going to, that's going to be a method that essentially just like doubles or however much you want on the speed, and just going to reset it back to normal after that. So healing power-ups, um, this is like a lot of games like, like to do healing. Um, I know Team Fortress 2 has like health pickups to give you um, health. And you know, one way it has like an upgrade to um, just essentially like emergency health pack. So the code here is for healing over time. So it's not like the some of the examples I showed over there were more like instant health. This one's more um, once you have this buff, you get health over time. So same idea, you pick up the healing, it sets the current buff to two. But instead of um, before, what it did is it uh, doubled your speed and then set it back to normal after the buff timer went out. Um, this time, it's actually going to heal you as um, the buff timer is active. So while the buff timer is active, it's just going to keep um, ticking and giving you health over, over time. And rapid fire, um, this is gonna be useful if you're gonna do like a shooter game. Uh, like, a, like we went over different types. We went over our um, movement and healing. This is more like an offensive boost. Could be useful in like enhancing your game and um, like giving it a faster pace. So for this one, again, we're still using our main a uh, pickup method, which when the player walks over that pickup object, it's going to call that. And this works sort of like how um, the speed works, where it sets in, inside like the player attack script, it's going to set that um, speed attack to true. And once the timer ends, it's going to set false. But I also went over the player attack script right here, um, just to like show like just like the details of it. Essentially, when we do our speed attack, it has a local variable called rapid fire on, and that remembers if the player has um, mul or like a rapid fire or not. So if the player doesn't have rapid fire, um, it can just do a normal attack by every time you click, you could it would just shoot. But if you have rapid fire on, you also get this. Um, you also get to use get mouse button zero, which is um, it registers holding buttons. So you can just hold your mouse button down, and it would shoot and 
at this rate, it would, it's like 0.2 seconds. It would keep firing. Um, the problem with this design, though, is that if you're just really good at clicking your mouse, you could sort of match that. So you might want to add like a cooldown in your like actual shooting. Or I mean, that that could just be a thing. So people can just go like no buff challenge. They can just like just rapid fire themselves. Um, and another thing for if you're doing a top-down shooter, something you might want to consider is just ammunition. And this ties into just resource management in general. Um, the idea of resource management is you want to sort of limit the player's resources and not give them inf infinite resources because it gives them a little bit of challenge. And the player, it sort of, this sort of forces the player to like work around this limit. Um, so essentially we're going to have our ammo manager script and that's what that's going to do is just, it would just keep track of the player's ammo or like their stats. And you would have like your basic like power ups, like which in this case would just be ammo that would just increase that. And as the player attacks, it would probably reference that ammo like manager to check if they have enough ammo to shoot. And if not, then they can't shoot. And another idea for power up is just to ignore the ammo limit. Um, this could be like rapid fire. If you get that, then you just have infinite ammo. So yeah, I talked about the ammo pickup object. It's just like any other um, power up. Just um, it's sort of a special type because it doesn't directly buff the player. But you could argue that having a resource is a buff because having no resources is just bad. Um, and yeah, we'll just talk to your ammo manager just like your other pickup objects. Cool. And now we'll go into our gameplay loops. All right, so I'm going to be talking about gameplay loops. So basically, the definition of gameplay loops are like repetitive actions that a player will take while playing a game. So uh, an example of this would be like you enter a new area in the game, you kill all the enemies in the area, and then you get rewards. Uh, that's like a very simple, high level um, gameplay loop. So then there's different levels to gameplay loops. So there's high level loops that are like objectives that players um, feel compelled, or objectives that compel players to take actions. And there's core level loops. So core level loops are the like lowest uh, of the gameplay uh, loops. Um, basically, they're the most repetitive action that will happen in the majority of time in a game. So in like a shooter, it would be like, oh, an enemy appears, you aim at the enemy, you fire at the enemy, the projectile moves towards the target, the projectile hits the target, and then the target dies, and then you loop into um, doing the same thing over again. That one lowest level, core level um, loop, plays into different like high level objectives, but yeah, your core level mechanic will be the mechanic that is happening the most in the game. Um, so like a World of Warcraft example would be like zone exploration would be high level. So you enter a new zone, you go to a quest into the quest hub loop. So then in the quest hub loop, you gather all the quests from NPCs in the hubs. You move around like nearby regions uh, near the quest hub. Uh, you finish the quest, you return the quest to the quest hub. Then you get some small rewards. Then you move to the next hub in the zone. And then once you finish all of those and get out of the continuous quest hub loops, you'll get like a large zone reward, and then you'll get a call to action to go into the next zone, and then you're just looping in zone exploration then. Um, so there's like kind of recursion, those sort of concepts in gameplay loops. Um, so like the core gameplay in WoW would be enter a new situation with, uh, with an obstacle, determine what strategy to use to defeat the obstacle, target the obstacle, use abilities and movement to attack the obstacle, hit obstacle with abilities, if, if the obstacle is defeated, move on to the next one. If not, keep like fighting that obstacle. Um, the WoW devs came out and said that this was like what they built, like core WoW based off of, which kind of explains why there were like expansions where movement was like heavily utilized and then it wasn't because they kind of forgot about their core loops at certain points in time. And that's also why classes don't really feel like they have identity, but those are just roasts of WoW. Um, so then like some more examples for people who haven't played WoW would be like in Clash of Clans, you collect resources, you build like your defenses, um, your like different buildings and that sort of thing, and then you train your units from those buildings, and then you collect 
more resources over again. That's only a few clicks, and that's like the base gameplay of Clash of Clans. In Halo, the base gameplay is run out of the like run out of cover, uh, attack by aiming like a gun or grenade, then like shooting said gun or grenade, and then moving back into cover, recharging your shields, and then you would run out of cover all over again. Um, that's what the devs really uh, wanted to emphasize, like the cover part. That's why Halo has shields, and that's why that shield mechanic became like really important in Halo. And that's an example of how knowing what your gameplay loop is allows you to focus on uh, perfecting the mechanics that really um, contribute to that gameplay loop. Um, so these are like some heuristics of um, gameplay loops that were like proven and used by most um, AAA studios and in industry right now. Um, the pa paper's pretty famous. It's like from 2004. Um, got spread around the industry like really fast. Toby Fox used these heuristics when making Undertale. So yeah, there's a bunch of them. Only um, like three of them don't actually apply to core gameplay. They apply to more of like aesthetic high level um, sort of situations. But the ones in pink are definitely core game gameplay and like providing users with like information on game status is always really important. You have to provide instructions, training, and help so that people learn core gameplay loops. Um, the player has to train into a core gameplay loop. It's not something that players normally will naturally pick, uh, like pick up with previous game knowledge. So um, it's really important to have training and help throughout the game to get those loops going. Um, and yeah, uh, there's a lot of them on there, so I'll just let people read them. They're pretty self-explanatory. Yeah, and I think that's it for today. Thanks for coming to the lecture. Yeah, so I mean, the, the following next lectures are just going to cover more of like more of like polish or just like things you can add to your game, such as like next week, we probably I think is going to be UI. And then, um, yeah, so um, we basically covered a lot of like the core mechanics to like just creating a game from scratch. Um, we kept it pretty vague because we want. To, we don't want to like give very like specific examples, because like the point of the whole point of making a game is like making something your own essentially. So that's why I try to like just give like example pseudo code, things like that. So yeah, I mean I look forward to just uh, continuing on, finishing, getting your games finished and getting polished. Cool. And work on projects. That'll be great.